This is a Lotus, and Lotus is the last brand to stay true to the classic sports car formula. Well, until now. Lotus is killing off their entire lineup of pure sports cars for a new generation of cars. Cars that are ditching simplicity in favor for computer control and, horror of horrors, electric drive. So let's take a look into the history of Lotus to see what its founders had envisioned for the brand and find out if the new stuff coming out of Hethel England is the right way forward or sports car sacrilege. I'm Guff, this is Albon, let's get started. This video is sponsored by Jackery. Colin Chapman. Born in 1928 in a little London village, Colin was a seemingly ordinary British boy from a seemingly ordinary family. And most of his childhood was exactly that, ordinary. But the young Chapman didn't want to be ordinary. He wanted to go fast. By the time he got to university, he was learning how to fly planes while pursuing his degree in civil engineering. And after he finished school, he wanted to keep flying, so he joined the Royal Air Force as an officer. But as he later found out, military life wasn't the life for him. And so within a year, Colin returned back to civilian life and got himself a ordinary job at a ordinary company, the British Aluminum Company. Sorry, the British Aluminium Company. And there he was tasked with selling ordinary aluminum to ordinary contractors to build ordinary buildings. But Colin knew, deep down, he wasn't ordinary. And while flying planes in the RAF wasn't in the cards for him, there was still a way for him to satisfy his craving for speed. Now, Colin hadn't exactly raced cars before, and he wasn't exactly buying sports cars with his ordinary engineer's salary, so he did what anyone would do in that situation. He built his own car. Using a 1930 Austin 7 as his base, he went to work cutting and modifying it to create his dream sports car. Colin went so far as to work extra long hours at the aluminum company in exchange for materials that he could use to build his race car. Whatever it took, he did it. And in 1948, his first creation was ready. He called it the Mark I. No doubt foreshadowing the fact that the car wasn't perfect and there were gonna be a few more iterations. But the nickname of the car? Lotus. Now, there's no real evidence as to why the car was called Lotus, but there is one theory. And that theory is love. Love for his then girlfriend, Hazel Williams, who he had nicknamed Lotus Blossom. And Hazel, Hazel supported Colin through it all all his wacky ideas and insanely long work hours. In fact, the Mark I Lotus was built in Hazel's parents' backyard shed. And when Colin was away or busy, it was Hazel back in the shed turning the wrenches, getting the Mark I ready for race day. Truly a dynamic duo. And speaking of race day, Colin and Hazel had entered the Mark I into a few local racing events. Now, Colin had never been to a motor race, ever, in his entire life. But hell, if he could fly a plane, he could fly a car or drive a car. And drive that car, he did. Colin was a superbly quick driver and the Mark I did well to keep up with the rest of the cars on the grid. Colin was smart and he knew there was a way to get an even greater edge. And so he used to spend hours upon hours reading through the rules and regulations of all the races he entered to see if there were any loopholes or gray areas that he could exploit to win the race. And with those loopholes, Colin and the Mark I outclassed all of these other gentlemen racers time and time again with win after win for the Little Lotus. With the prize money from those races, Colin and Hazel developed the Mark II. This used the same Austin 7 chassis, but now it had box chassis rails, tubular cross members, and instead of the dinky old Austin engine, under the bonnet was a 30 horsepower Ford side valve engine. Unfortunately for Colin, he still had commitments with the Royal Air Force. And so, before his beloved Mark II could be built, he was shipped off to the military. Thankfully, his other beloved came in to help. And Hazel essentially built the entire Mark II by herself in that shed. And by the time Colin got back from the Air Force, that car was ready to race. He entered the car into various British trials races, and the Mark II did pretty damn well. And it was so fast at trials, Colin thought, well, we may as well take it to the track. And so he took the Mark II to a race at Silverstone Raceway and promptly won his class. This was huge. Track racing was far more intensive than just trials races. And Colin was so fast that he decided to ditch trials altogether and focus only on circuit racing. And it was from this moment on that the legend of Colin Chapman and Lotus began to grow. The Mark II dominated, and with the prize money he won from those races, he built the Mark III. The Mark III was even faster, and soon people began to take notice of Colin Chapman and his garage-built race cars. People started asking Colin to consult on their own race cars and help them go faster, and they were willing to pay the big bucks for it. By 1952, Colin and Hazel knew they had something special on their hands, and so they formed Lotus Cars, a company that specialized in building cars and winning races. And by 1954, 
before, Lotus had grown into an engineering firm and Team Lotus, a dedicated racing team that competed all over England. And even the engineering team that Hazel hired grew to become their own legends, with the likes of Mike Costin and Keith Duckworth, the future proprietors of Cosworth. And it wasn't just race car consulting now. By the time they got to the Mark VI, Chapman and the Lotus team had gentlemen racers knocking down their door to buy the same car that they saw Lotus racing on the track. They ended up selling 100 Lotus 6s through 1956. And at that point, Colin and Hazel knew they had a real business opportunity. So the next generation of Lotus, the Lotus 7, had to be something special. And it had to embody Colin Chapman's personal race car ethos. One that appears on garage banners and blip shift shirts 70 years on. Simplify and add lightness. These were the words that Colin Chapman lived by. And for years, he'd been telling everyone that adding power just makes you faster in the straights. Removing weight makes you faster everywhere. And so the Lotus 7 was just that, a small, nimble, extremely lightweight, purpose-built race car. And when I say lightweight, I mean it. The Lotus 7 weighed just 1,100 pounds. And just for reference, that's less than half the weight of a Miata. They were initially fitted with a 50 horsepower Ford flathead engine. And with its simple yet effective suspension layouts, it was darn quick around the track. Oh, and guess what? It was street legal too. So you could drive it to work during the week, and then drive it to the track on the weekend. People went bananas over the seven, and Lowe's sold nearly 2,500 of them, which was 25 times as many as the previous car. And by now, anyone and everyone that knew about racing knew about Lotus. Chapman himself kept racing as well, working his way through the ranks and winning race after race. But all of that came to a very abrupt end. You see, in 1956, Colin was given the opportunity to pilot the Van Wall Formula One car. This was huge. It was Colin's first foray into the highest level of professional racing. But during practice for the French Grand Prix, Colin was pacing his teammate, Mike Hawthorne. And coming into the hairpin after the long straight, Colin's rear brakes locked up and he lost control of the car. He careened off track and went directly into a concrete barrier, destroying the car. Chapman was fine. He got out and walked walked out, visibly quite angry, and went on to later say that one of the Van Wall mechanics had put the rear brake pads in backwards. F1 was truly a different beast in the 1950s. The owner of the team, Tony Vandervel, was understandably not too pleased with one of his expensive race cars being written off in practice, and so he fired Chapman. Now, Chapman was lucky. He got away with perhaps only a bruised ego, but this crash was enough for him to step back from the racing side of things and focus on the engineering of the cars instead. Hey, yo, who turned out the lights? No reports millions of Texans are in the dark. Well, it looks like we've got another power outage. Lucky for me, I've got Jackery. The Jackery Explorer is a portable battery powered generator. It's equipped with AC outlets for all your household gadgets and DC power with USB-C and A, as well as a DC car outlet. And when the Texas power grid fails or your JDM junker breaks down somewhere in middle America, or you're just on a glamping trip, the Jackery Explorer 1000 can keep you going. A thousand watts of continuous power means you can plug in your studio lights and keep filming like me. Or you can keep your jalopy engine bay illuminated and all your tools charged up so you can at least keep trying to finish your project car for next season or heck you know that project car isn't getting done so power up your tv and gaming console and play video games for hours with no worries and when juice is running low you can whip out the solar saga 100 watt solar panels and charge up the explorer with nothing but pure sunshine leave the oil burning for your nissan so hit the link in the description below to get your own jackery explorer kit and be prepared with safe quiet and green power at your fingertips whenever you need it. Now, back to the video. Now, his team, Team Lotus, had been dominating in Formula 2, and even had class wins at the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And so in 1958, they decided to join the big leagues themselves, Formula 1. But where Lotus used to dominate in the lower ranks, they were getting left behind in F1. Many teams were switching from front engine to mid-engine layouts, and they were outclassing Lotus in nearly every race. It wasn't until two years later, in 1960, that Lotus had developed a mid-engine car of their own, the Lotus 18. And it was that very year that they won their very first race, at the Monaco Grand Prix, with none other than the legendary Sterling Moss behind the wheel. The next year, they won the US Grand Prix. And by 1963, with the legendary Jim Clark behind the wheel of the Lotus 25, Chapman and Team Lotus finally won the whole damn thing and became the 1963 F1 World Champions. 
and the winds don't stop there. There was now a whole array of road-going Lotuses, with the Lotus 7 still on sale alongside the Lotus Elite, a car based on the Mark 14. And they had the all-new Lotus Elan. The Elan was a steel frame, fiberglass body road car, which was vastly different from the fiberglass monocoques they were using in their previous car. This allowed for a strong torsional rigidity while being relatively lightweight, and the Elan in full road-going trim only weighed 1,500 pounds. The Elan's engine was high-tech too, with a 1.5 liter dual overhead cam four-cylinder engine making 105 horsepower. In that day and age, that was a lot of power for a small engine, and it really showed off Lotus's engineering chops. All of this combined to make the biggest commercial success that Lotus had seen to date, with the Elan selling somewhere around 12,000 units over the course of its production. Back on the racetrack, Team Lotus was dominating the 1964 F1 season, but on the final race of the season, Jim Clark's Lotus just wasn't reliable enough to bring them the win. The next year in 1965 though, Lotus pulled it off with Jim Clark in a Lotus 33. But the 1966 F1 season saw a regulation change that increased the maximum engine displacement to three liters. And this caught Lotus off guard. They cobbled together a two liter V8 for the season, but it was truly awful. They switched midway to a three liter flat 16 engine, which sounds badass, but it ended up being too heavy and too unreliable for them to be competitive at all. And so Lotus ended the 1966 season with a pitiful record. But this was Lotus, and Colin Chapman was already hard at work trying to find a replacement engine. He couldn't do it alone though, and he needed big brains and even bigger backing. And so Chapman went to Ford, a company he had a great relationship with, having used their engines many times over the years. And he convinced them to to sponsor a new engine development by this new engineering firm called Cosworth, an engineering firm composed of former Lotus engineers Mike Costin and Keith Duckworth. What they came up with was the Cosworth Double Four Valve, or DFV for short. This was a 3 liter V8 that made over 400 horsepower, and it weighed hundreds of pounds less than that old flat 16 engine. And so for the 1967 season, Lotus came back with a vengeance, thanks to the power of the Cosworth V8. They didn't win the title that year, but they got damn close, and they were convinced that the next year, 1968, would be the year the team Lotus would be holding the gold again, until it all went horribly wrong. You see, Lotus had some of the most impressive cars in Formula One, but by this point in time, many people were starting to question Chapman's engineering focus, namely his undeterred mission for lightness. The Lotus cars had been some of the fastest on the grid, but their structural integrity just wasn't the best. There were a surprising number of drivers that were seriously injured in Lotuses over the years. Sterling Moss, Alan Stacy, Mike Spence, and Graham Hill, to name a few. But none of them were quite as tragic as the Lotus 48 crash in 1968. Lotus had dominated the F1 season opener race with a 1-2 finish, and many people favored them to take this season by storm. Lotus's lead driver, Jim Clark, was driving exceptionally well. Before the second F1 race of the season, though, Jim Clark took the previous season's Lotus 48 to an exhibition race at the Hockenheim ring for Formula 2. This wasn't a championship race or anything, just another race for Clark to stay sharp and prepare for the upcoming F1 battle. But on the fifth lap of the race, Jim Clark's Lotus 48 suddenly lost control and veered off the track into some trees. The crash was catastrophic, and Clark suffered major injuries to his head and neck. And despite first responders' best efforts, Jim Clark died before he could reach the hospital. This was truly a devastating moment for everyone at Lotus, and doubly so for Colin Chapman. He and Clark were extremely close, and despite how tough of a loss this was for Chapman himself, people still began to point fingers at him and at Lotus Engineering, claiming the crash was the fault of the car and not the driver. It was no surprise to anyone that Lotuses were pushed further than other race cars. Dan Gurney, another legendary racing driver, once said, did I think the Lotus way of doing things was good? No, we had several structural failures in those cars, but at the time, I felt it was the price you paid for getting something significantly better. And that was the thing. Racing is a brutal sport, especially so in the 1960s. Winning races meant doing everything in your power to eke out a tenth or even a hundredth of a second on a lap, because that was the margin between winning and losing. But with that comes risk. And it was Jim Clark who paid for it in his Lotus. Chapman, though, was not the type of person to hang his hat after a horrible tragedy like this. He wanted to keep racing. He had to keep racing, it was a part of him. And so, continue racing, he did. That very same year, Graham Clark, another Lotus driver, took the F1 World Championship 
in his Lotus 49. And when the entire sport was threatened, when automotive companies like BP, Shell, and Firestone had pulled out of sponsoring F1, it was Colin Chapman who pushed for outside sponsorship to keep the sport alive. 1969 was a bit of a crap year for Lotus with some weird turbine cars. But in 1970, they revealed the Lotus 72 with side-mounted radiators, inboard brakes, and a huge rear wing. And when they got that design sorted, they dominated on track, thanks to ace driver Jochen Rindt. That is, until the end of the season in Monza, where Rindt's Lotus snapped a brake shaft and careened him into a barrier, killing him. Another fast Lotus and another dead driver. In a strange turn of events, Rint had won a ton of points from dominating the beginning of the season. And so he became the first and only person in the world to win an F1 championship posthumously. And despite yet another tragedy, it wasn't enough to deter Colin Chapman. And in 1972, they took the championship again, with the young Emerson Fittipaldi at the wheel of the John Player special Lotus 72. Lotus went on to win again in 1973, and again in 1978 with Mario Andretti, making the 70s one of the greatest periods of racing in Lotus's history. And off the racetrack, Lotus had been making moves to expand its lineup of sports cars for the road. Through the late 60s, they had continued to sell the Lotus 7 and a new, bigger Lotus Elan 2 plus 2. The one thing that was missing though, was a mid-engined sports car. All the Grand Prix cars had switched to mid-engine, but most of the road cars at the time were still front engine. And so Lotus decided they needed to design a attainable mid-engined two-door sports coupe. They called it the Europa. And in traditional Colin Chapman style, it embodied simplify and add lightness. It weighed about 1,400 pounds thanks to a fiberglass body and sported a Renault four-cylinder engine making 82 horsepower. But you know what? People liked it. It was a light, nimble sports car with great suspension. And it could do over 0.9 G on the skid pad, which was an amazing feat of handling at the time. Initially, it was just available for Europeans, but in 1970, Lotus created a handful of federalized Europas for the American market. But despite how good the Europa was, it was still a pretty niche car. And by the end of its run in 1975, Lotus had only managed to sell about 9,000 of them. Not very many compared to other car manufacturers at the time. They sold far fewer Elan and Lotus 7s too. And it was becoming quickly apparent that Colin Chapman's dream of funding race cars by selling road cars was slipping from his fingers. In the mid 70s, Lotus made a Hail Mary effort to keep cash flow up and they sold the rights of the Lotus 7 to a company called Caterer. And they tried to come out with new and innovative models like the Lotus Esprit, the successor to the Lotus Europa. But by 1980, the dream seemed well and truly dead. Lotus was producing less than 400 cars a year, thanks in large part to the fact that the world was seeing an economic recession. And most of those cars kind of sucked, like the Lotus Eclat, which had a chassis that was so poorly designed it would start to disintegrate from corrosion in just a few years. It really seemed like the writing was on the wall for Lotus. Frantically, Colin Chapman worked out a deal in 1982 to keep his business afloat and set up an agreement with Toyota to trade intellectual property and for Toyota to become a major shareholder in Lotus. This also led to Lotus being contracted to help develop the Mark II Toyota Supra, also called the Celica XX, which we talked about in our Celica history video up here. In exchange for that, Toyota would give Lotus drivetrains and components for use in their cars. Using components from the A60 Supra, Lotus developed the XL. This was a front engine sports car that used a Toyota W58 five-speed manual transmission paired to a Lotus 2.2 liter four-cylinder engine that they stole from the Esprit. And the XL was praised for its excellent excellent handling and 50-50 weight distribution. But it was never released in the US due to strict emissions regulations in the country. And so despite being a pretty good car, it just wasn't the X factor to turn Lotus around. But that wasn't the biggest tragedy to hit Lotus that year. In December of 1982, Colin Chapman suffered a heart attack and died at the age of 54. The man who built Lotus with his very own hands, the man who pushed through roadblock after roadblock and won seven F1 world championships was no more. And many people thought with Lotus already on the ropes, the death of Colin Chapman meant the death of Lotus. And if that wasn't enough, the late Colin Chapman was now being caught up in the infamous DeLorean scandal. Lotus had helped design the chassis of the DMC DeLorean. But when John DeLorean was busted for cocaine trafficking and illegal use of UK subsidies, it came to light that Colin Chapman was on the docket as well for a lot of illegal money movement. The UK government had no choice but to take action against Lotus. And the judge on the case even said that had Colin Chapman been alive, he would have gotten at least a 10 year sentence for his involvement. Interestingly enough, the UK government actually sold off off some of the intellectual property that they had seized from John DeLorean and Lotus. And you know who the buyer was? 
Toyota, and they used it to make the first generation MR2. Anyways, Lotus was done. Case closed, video over. Surely there is no way to recover from something of this magnitude. But people forgot Lotus wasn't built alone. Colin Chapman, all those years ago, would never have been able to build that Lotus Mark I if it wasn't for one person. Hazel Chapman. You see, Hazel didn't just retire to being the wife of the eccentric Colin Chapman. She was involved in every step of Lotus from day one. And when Colin passed, Hazel stepped up and took the responsibility of ensuring that Lotus kept heading in the right direction. She kept Team Lotus on the racetracks along with manager Peter Ward. And she saw to ensuring that Lotus was given better management. That management was provided by David Wiggins, the owner of the British Car Auctions Company. Wickens ended up buying a 29% stake in Lotus and became the new acting chairman. And he negotiated with the UK government to convince them to allow outside investment into Lotus. Most notable of which was the 1986 majority sale of Lotus to General Motors. GM had even managed to convince Toyota to sell their stake in Lotus. And so by the end of 1986, GM owned 91% of Lotus. And the new GM-led Lotus's first plan of action was to revive the Elan, a car that had been out of production for 14 years. Lotus already had a prototype called the M90, which was a Toyota-powered front-wheel drive coupe. It was supposed to be sold as a Lotus Toyota. But after Lotus's sale to GM, the M90 evolved into the M100, which used a Isuzu drivetrain instead. It launched in 1989 and sold either as a 130 horsepower NA variant or a 162 horsepower turbocharged variant. All in all, it looked like a great car. Car. It was just too bad then that in the very same year, Mazda decided to release a rear-wheel drive roadster called the Miata, and it put the Elan to shame. Over its entire lifespan, Lotus only managed to sell only about 4,000 Elans. Compare that to the Mazda Miata, which sold nearly 60,000 units in the first year. Okay, so the Elan was a flop, but this was GM. They sell millions of cars. Surely, they'd get it right on the second time. Cue the second time the Lotus Carlton. Now, ignoring the fact that this car was named after one of the greatest TV show characters of the 1990s, the Lotus Carlton was not actually really a Lotus at all. You see, GM also happened to own Vauxhall and Opel, brands that largely operated in Europe and Australia. And instead of spending all that money engineering a new car for Lotus, GM did what GM does best. They brand engineered a car. This meant taking the Opel Omega, also known as the Vauxhall Carlton, and souping it up. The base car was a fairly basic front-engined rear-wheel drive sedan that came with a variety of four-cylinder and six-cylinder options. Lotus took that vanilla car and sprinkled a little racing pedigree into it, increasing the displacement from 3 liters to 3.6 and slapping two Garrett turbochargers on it. The result was a 377 horsepower engine paired to a six-speed manual transmission borrowed from the Corvette ZR1. And this meant that the Lotus Carlton could reach a top speed of 186 miles per hour, making it the fastest production sedan in the world. And you know what happened? Automotive journalists complained that it was too fast. Bob Murray, the editor of Auto Car Magazine said, nobody could argue that they need to go 180 miles per hour. Are you freaking kidding me? Lotus finally makes something half decent and you complain that they're too good at going fast? Add to that the fact that the Daily Mail teamed up with the Association of Police Officers in the UK and tried to have the Carlton banned from the roads. That law didn't pass, of course, but the hate on the Carlton was real enough that they only ever produced 950 of them, making it yet another failure. By Lotus. And for the bean counters in Detroit, it was a failure for GM as well. And so in 1993, Lotus was sold off again, this time to the owner of Bugatti, Romano Artioli. He didn't do much with it, just making more Elans and Esprits with different engines and stuff, none of them selling particularly well. And it was under his ownership that Team Lotus finally pulled out of Formula One in 1994. And just two years later, in 1996, he sold the company, again, to Proton a Malaysian car manufacturer. At this point, Lotus really was the unwanted orphan of the sports car world. Nobody wanted them, and the people that did buy them just couldn't make anything work. A far cry from the lofty goals of the Chapmans, and certainly a disappointing outcome for a company that was full of so much potential. And now, they were owned by a Malaysian car company that nobody had ever heard of. Lotus, yet again, was doomed. Well, this time, Maybe not. You see, back in 1994, Lotus Engineering had been developing a new sports car, as they do. It was to be small, mid-engined, 
rear wheel drive, and pretty dang lightweight. This time using a aluminum chassis for strength and a fiberglass body. The then owner, Romano Artioli, liked it so much that he named it after his granddaughter, Elisa. So the car was to be called the Lotus Elise. And it was a lightweight, target top sports car paired to a 1.8 liter Rover engine making 118 horsepower. It looked super promising, but Romano Artioli was in such dire financial straits that he sold Lotus one month after its release. Proton, the company that now owned Lotus, saw the Elise and saw its potential. And so they went all in to produce this car both in England and in Malaysia. And you know what? It worked. The automotive world praised the Elise on its superb handling, featherweight body, and racy go-kart looks. It was reminiscent of the old rear-wheel drive Lotus Elan, razor-sharp steering, and gobs and gobs of feel and feedback. And the Elise was a car that truly embodied Colin Chapman's simplify and add lightness. There was no radio, no cup holders, the passenger seat didn't move, and the driver's seat had a hand pump to fill air into the bolsters to make it a tighter fit. This was, by far and away, the best sports car to come out of Lotus in a long time. And over the years, Lotus continued to iterate and upgrade the Elise, boosting power to 143 horsepower on the 111S model, and then 177 horsepower in the 340R limited edition. And then in the year 2000, the Elise was doing so well that Lotus revealed the second generation Series 2 Elise. Oddly enough, the development of the second gen Elise was funded by GM, who clearly had major FOMO after seeing Lotus succeed after they sold him off. And so in return for funding its development, Lotus agreed to make Opel and Vauxhall versions of the Elise. And so the Elise was built alongside the Opel Speedster and the Vauxhall VX220. And instead of the standard 1.8 liter Rover engines, these new Bizarro Elises got a 2.2 liter GM Ecotec engine. Not to be outdone though, Lotus decided now was the time to make a hardtop version of the Elise and they called it the Exige. This was an even more hardcore version of the Elise with a revised clamshell body, larger wheels, and even a rear wing. Oh, and they upped the power to 190 horsepower in the track spec model in a car that weighed 1,700 pounds. And wouldn't you know it, Lotus was no longer selling cars in the hundreds of units. They were selling cars in the thousands with nearly 2,000 cars a year being sold in the first few years of production. This was finally the return to form that Lotus needed. And no doubt a testament to the perseverance of the Lotus team, and of course, Hazel Chapman. And the cars they were producing were true to the philosophies that the company was founded on. In 2004, they killed the Esprit. Yeah, they were still making it, even though nobody was buying it. And then in that same year, they made the single most important change they ever made in the history of Lotus. They dropped the Rover engines and switched to Toyota. Yes, Lotus had struck a deal with their old owners, Toyota, to borrow the 2ZZ inline four-cylinder engine from the Celica GTS and stick it in the back of the Elise and the Exige. And this was a fantastic idea because not only did the 2ZZ make 190 horsepower, it was also reliable, something that certainly couldn't be said about the Rover lumps they had before. And in addition to that, this meant that Lotus could finally start selling cars in the US. Now, the US model was slightly changed and had a few odd quirks, like headlights that magnify the rays from the sun and melted their own inner housings. But who cares? That was just the car making itself lighter, I guess. And then in 2005, Lotus decided, well, the standard 2ZZ isn't enough for our hardcore Exige. And so they did a limited run of 50 cars with a supercharger strapped to it. They called it the 240R and it put down 243 horsepower, which might not sound like much, but this car did zero to 60 in 3.9 seconds. This was an absolute rocket ship of a Lotus. And people liked it so much that Lotus had no choice but to turn it into a full production model the very next year. This time, they called it the Exige S. The S model only had 220 horsepower, but that was still plenty fast, and they sold it in North America. It's safe to say that at this point, Lotus had finally found its new group. Gearheads around the world knew what Lotus was, and kids lusted after Elises and Exiges that they saw on the streets. Hell, I even had a poster of an Elise hanging on my bedroom wall. I bought it at the Scholastic Book Fair. And in 2006, they were doing so well, they decided to try something different. And so Lotus took the Elise and fattened it up to create a more grand touring type car called the Europa S. Yes, the same Europa name was brought back from the dead, this time for a variation on the Elise. But instead of coasting on the success of the Toyota power plants, Lotus decided to put a GM Ecotec 2 liter engine into it. And perhaps unsurprisingly, 
nobody really liked it. Turns out, taking a track-focused sports car and making it fatter and putting a worse engine in it was a bad idea. But the Europa experiment was enough of a seed in the minds of the Lotus engineers to want something more than just the Elise and the Exige. The current offerings from Lotus were pretty much dedicated to the most hardcore of track enthusiasts. And there was a massive market of people who wanted something that had that Lotus magic but was still pleasant to drive on the road. And so having learned from the failure of the Europa, Lotus went back to the drawing board and created an all new design. One that was made from the very beginning to be a Lotus for the road first, not the track. And what they came up with was the Lotus Evora. The Evora was Lotus's first all new vehicle platform in over a decade. Gone was the tiny Elise chassis and in its place a much larger aluminum monocoque. This time designed for four passengers as a two plus two coupe. And they learned their lesson with the Europa's lackluster GM engine. This time it was a Toyota 3.5 liter V6 mounted amidship. Yes, that's the same engine from the Camry. But before you groan, this humble little Camry engine made 276 horsepower and 258 pound feet of torque, which was plenty more than the 2Z Z was mustering in the Elise and the Exige. Now, there was one caveat. The big body and big engine meant that the Evora weighed over 3,000 pounds, which may have been light compared to other competitor sports cars, but it was hardly the most Chapman of Lotuses. But despite its downfalls, People loved the Evora. Journalists called it a grown-up Elise, something that provided many of the thrills of a small dedicated sports car, but with far more refinement than the Elise or Exige had. It went head-to-head -head with the Porsche Caymans of the world. And while it certainly wasn't up to the build quality of the Germans, it had great suspension, fantastic steering, and more than enough power to keep up. And so now Lotus finally had a full lineup. Three great cars, all critically successful and all selling pretty well. Surely then, Lotus must have been taking a sizable profit. Well, not exactly. You see, Lotus had posted annual losses every year since the 1970s. And although their current lineup had some pretty solid sales, all it meant was that they were losing less money than the year before. But hey, that's something. I guess. For Lotus from here, it was all about buckling down and keeping their cars fresh and exciting in a very competitive car market. And that's exactly what they did. Pretty much every year, Lotus found a way to make their cars lighter or more powerful, with nearly every model getting a supercharged variant at some point. Including the Evora, which took that little Camry engine from 276 horsepower to 345 horsepower. More than enough to keep up with a Cayman S. It took them a while, but in 2017, after 47 years of being in the red, Lotus finally posted their first profit. They went from being a hopeless niche car brand that was kicked down the investment curb by company after company to now finally being a successful car manufacturer with real profit and boundless prospects of growth. Well, that's what we thought, except in that very same year, Lotus got sold again. If you recall, Lotus was majority owned by Proton, that Malaysian car manufacturer. And it turns out, Proton was trending in the opposite direction of Lotus. Their business was failing, and they desperately needed a lifeline to keep them from bankruptcy. That lifeline was Geely. Geely is a giant Chinese car manufacturer. And by giant, I mean their revenue is north of 10 billion US dollars annually. And they happen to be the very same company that bought out Volvo when they were on the brink of failure. Geely ended up buying 49.9% of Proton and a controlling 51% share of Lotus, all for $235 million. Now that might sound like a hefty sum, but it was pennies on the dollar for brands as big and notable as Proton and Lotus. This initially seemed like a terrifying turn of events for Lotus as they were just on the brink of becoming profitable and new ownership meant a potentially catastrophic shakeup in management, one that could easily send the company back into the red. But Geely's dealings with Volvo seem to indicate otherwise. You see, the Chinese firm gave Volvo engineering autonomy with Geely just overseeing the financial aspect of things. And for Lotus, it was largely the same, with Geely appointing a few new board members, but leaving Jean-Marc Gales, the Lotus boss, still in charge of Lotus. Add to that the fact that Geely said they would invest over $120 million of their own cash into Lotus's growth. And what we ended up with was Lotus perhaps finally, for the first time ever, being traded into the right hands. A parent company that was not only financially stable, but one that would also invest into Lotus continuing to build cars their way. The simplify and add lightness way. The Colin Chapman way. At least, that's what we thought. But five years on from that fateful deal, now, I'm not so sure. Since 2017, Lotus had continued to sell the same trio of cars, the Elise, the Exige, the Evora. But in 2019, Lotus had unveiled something totally new, something that we had never seen from them before. 
a hypercar. It was called the Lotus Evia, a limited production car that would not only be Lotus's first hypercar, but also their first production electric vehicle. Now only 130 units of the Avia were slated for production. And well, you could probably guess that a limited hypercar would probably be pretty pricey. You're right. The Avia will set you back $315,000 for the deposit, with the final price being $2.3 million. It's to be powered by a 70 kilowatt hour battery pack designed by the Williams F1 team with four electric motors powering each wheel, bringing the Avia to a total of 1,974 horsepower. Numbers that are said to rocket this 3,700 pound hypercar to 200 miles per hour and keep you going for 215 miles of total range. There is one caveat though, these are all computer simulated numbers. Lotus claims that the pandemic has slowed down real life testing. Oh, and it's delayed the launch of the car a few times. So honestly, why do we care? A hypercar too expensive to even own in our wildest dreams with simulated performance numbers? Well, we care because the Avia is a glimpse at the Lotus of the future. You see, in 2021, Lotus told the world that the Elise, Exige, and Evora were all being retired. Yes, all three of the cars that rebooted this brand after a near half century hiatus axed. They announced a few badass final edition versions of the Elise and the Exige, but after that, they were done. In its place would be an entirely new lineup with the all electric Evia hypercar being at the top and then one successor to the Elise Exige and Evora called the Emira. Now it might sound a bit crazy that there was one successor to three different cars, but here's the deal. The Emira was not only going to be a mid-engine lightweight rear wheel drive sports car like its predecessors, but it was also going to be the very last Lotus powered by an internal combustion engine. Yes, the brand that built its reputation on its simplistic elegance was now telling the world that every car going forward was going to be electric. It seemed asinine. EVs are computer controlled, silent, heavy, all seemingly unlotus like things. But under the new guard at Lotus, this was the only way forward. The EV revolution is inevitable and Lotus had to understand that. And considering Volvo's aggressive electrification after coming under the wings of Geely, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that Lotus quickly followed suit. But enough EV doom and gloom, the Amira is a mid-engine sports car powered by dinosaur explosions. And what a car it is. Available with a Mercedes AMG two liter turbo making 360 horsepower or a supercharged Toyota V6 making 400 horsepower, the Amira has fun options for the whole family. Oh, and it comes with an eight speed DCT, six speed slush box or six speed manual transmission, thank God. And not just any manual transmission. In the Amira, you can even see the gear linkage like a freaking Pagani. In its lightest form, it weighs in at a reasonable 3,100 pounds and scoots to 60 in 4.5 seconds. And when it finally does get released this fall, you can expect to pay $94,000 for a first edition model. And later on, when the base model comes out, $74,000, $75,000. Certainly not cheap, but hey, it's the only new Lotus you can buy. And that brings me to a question that's been nagging my mind since Lotus first started this extensive rebranding. Is Lotus even Lotus anymore? Now, Lotus has had its fair share of ups and downs, and they made some pretty spectacularly crap cards back in the day. But the thing that had always brought them back, their North Star, was one thing, Colin Chapman. And not just Chapman the man, Chapman the ideology, the things he stood for. Colin Chapman said simplify and add lightness again and again and again. It's why his race cars were so darn fast. It's why his race cars were so dangerous. It was a flawed philosophy, but it was the Lotus philosophy. And the only reason that Lotus rose from the ashes in 1996 was because the Elise was an embodiment of the Chapman way. And after Chapman's death, there were a few people like Hazel that ensured that the Chapman way was indeed the way forward. But times have changed and most of those people have left the ranks of Lotus. Hazel Chapman passed away just two months ago in December of 2021 at the age of 94. And even into her old age, she was always involved. No new Lotus ever made its way to the public eye without the approval of Hazel. But now Lotus is in the hands of Geely and they've already started to make decisions that seem unlotus like The Avia being an electric hypercar is fine. They're pushing racing technology forward. The Amira isn't quite the lightweight sports car that the Elise and the Exige were. And it certainly is sad that there's nothing left in the market that fills that gap. But it certainly is a good replacement for the Evora. But beyond that, Lotus has plans for a four-door sedan and not one, but two electric SUVs. 
And look, when Lamborghini made an SUV, we said, okay. And when Ferrari made an SUV, we said, it's kind of disappointing, but fine. But Lotus? In what world does an SUV embody simplify and add lightness? Lotus, in a matter of a few short years, seems to have made a huge ideological leap. And the essence of its founders seems to have been lost in the process. This very well might be the best business decision for Lotus. And it might be the only way the brand will survive going forward. But Ask yourself this, if these new Lotuses have nothing in common with every Lotus that predates them, is Lotus dead? Or is this what Lotus was always destined to become? Let me know in the comments section below and thank you for watching. Do subscribe if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next one.